<clears throat> so, this is the second week of our 2020 vision series. And over the course of this series, we will focus on five leaders and their unique vision for the church and hope for the world. So last week, we discussed the one and only Jesus and his hope for the world. Well, today is MLK Day, so Sunday, one of my favorites. So today in Sermon 2, we will focus on Martin Luther King Jr. and his unique vision and dream for our world. So this morning, we're going to talk about three moments in history. We're going to move together from ancient Mesopotamia to the civil rights Memphis to modern-day Modesto. And as we travel through time together, we will uncover that from age to age, we find ourselves in the same march towards freedom. Part one, fifth century BCE, Mesopotamia, the Egyptian Exodus. He had walked all day under the blistering sun. With each step, the hot sand engulfed his sandals and threatened to pull him down to bake in this desert's trap. He was surrounded by dry wasteland, and yet the watery tears of lament bathed his face. Exodus chapter two, Verse 15 says, when Moses realized what he had done, he fled from Egypt into the desert. Now many of us know the story of Moses. He was a Hebrew who was spared at birth and adopted by Egyptian royalty. So he grew up in the palace. He wore an Egyptian crown, yes, but his hair was textured like the Hebrews. He ate all he wanted, yes, but his features matched the starving faces of the Hebrew people. He knew those, yes, were his people, and yet he, quote, watched them labor hard without doing anything. And in Exodus 2, which we heard today. Moses leaves his palatial ivory tower for the first time his eyes are opened to all that plagued the Hebrew people. He sees firsthand the violence and the death and the hunger inflicted on these marginalized, suffering people. He comes face to face with the problems at hand and he realizes that the plague of injustice is across the land. And the startling realization becomes too much for him to bear, and so he runs away. But God follows him. In the midst of lament, Moses wanders up this mountainside, and that's when God's vision comes upon. He hears the voice of God billow from the burning bush. You remember the burning bush. In Exodus 3, this is a different translation than what we just heard. It says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people, says the Lord. I have heard them crying out, and I am concerned about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land of freedom. God commanded Moses, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of oppression. Lo, I am who I say I am, and lo, I will be with you always. So in this holy encounter, in this famous burning bush moment, Moses sees God's vision of a world 
world that could be. A promised land where slaves find liberation, where the oppressed find freedom, where the broken find healing, where the poor find hope, where the privileged find purpose. A promised land where God's righteousness and justice and truth will prevail. You see, all was not lost. The plague of injustice had a powerful antidote. Action. God inspired, God empowered, God commissioned action. You see, for this vision to be realized, God's people had to be mobilized. Can we say that together? Let's try it. For this vision to be realized, God's people would need to be mobilized. Have you ever noticed that freedom takes fighting for? Yeah. God did not say that the promised land would just magically appear. Right? No, God's people would have to use their two freedom-fighting feet and walk out on injustice. They would have to move. They would have to resist. They would have to march towards God's future if they had any hope of getting there. And boy, did they march. They marched towards freedom. Hundreds of thousands of Hebrew leave. Egypt, out into the desert. The Hebrews follow Moses past the jail cells of oppression, past the shackled places of injustice, past the barren ground of inequality into a new promised land. That was then. Part two, 1960 Memphis, the Civil Rights Movement. Like Moses, many of you know the story of Martin Luther King Jr. He was an African-American theologian who grows up with the privilege of higher education. He attended undergraduate, graduate school, and we find him at 25 years old getting his PhD from Boston Seminary. Y'all think I'm young. 25 years old is when he started his ministry. And he was studying the likes of theologian Jürgen Moltmann, who urged, quote, that Christian testimony must be related to the sickness of the given society, meaning that the Christian life should actively address the sickness of our time. And so Martin Luther King looks out and sees the dire woes of racial and economic injustice in America. And so in 1954, age 25, he decides to leave his palatial ivory tower of academia, the safety of the North, and go and see firsthand the violence, death, hunger inflicted on his people the marginalized and suffering people in the heartland of the self. And he comes face to face with the problems at hand, and he too realizes that injustice is plagued across the land. And so he begins his ministry as a pastor in Alabama. And he was not immune to the infectious plague of injustice. He was threatened and beaten and blamed. And later he would be bombed and knifed and hosed down. He faced the sickness of our time head on, and let me tell you, it took a toll. In a moment of lament, after receiving yet another death threat, Martin Luther King wanders into his kitchen late one night in 1956, and God's vision comes upon him. He reflects on this memory saying this, quote, with my cup of coffee
coffee sitting untouched before me, I was ready to give up. With my head in my hands, I bowed and prayed aloud. Lord, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, what I believe is of you. But Lord, I must confess I am faltering. I am losing my courage. I am afraid. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. And he heard God speak to him in response. Quote, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. I could hear an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you, even until the end of the world. End quote. Words that no doubt the biblical scholar knew echoed the voice of God spoken to Moses. A reminder, indeed, he was not alone in the fight for freedom. In this holy encounter, Martin Luther King is reminded, renewed, refreshed, thinking about God's vision of the world that could be, a promised land where God's righteousness and justice and truth will prevail. But for this vision to be realized, God's people would need to be mobilized. And thus begins the historic mobilization led by Martin Luther King as a Christian church across America, across all denominations, class, creeds, race, gathered for the sake of the gospel to unite and fight together using Christ's very tools of love and nonviolence. They face the future united and unafraid. And we watched our world begin to change. Our laws, our practices, our hearts transformed. A King scholar named Louis Baldwin writes this, from that night on, King never abandoned the hope that American churches could be more than just a social club, but would be instrumental in bringing about a new world order. King believed the church could contribute to the elimination of the social evils of racism, poverty, and economic injustice. In other words, King believed the plague of injustice had a powerful antidote, Christian action. God-inspired, God-powered, God-commissioned Christian action. And so God's people marched together. Now the story of Moses and the story of Martin Luther King have similar endings. At the end of his life, Moses goes up to the mountaintop and looks down and sees the promised land ahead. The vision he had so longed for was in his sightline, but Moses knew he would not get there with God's people. He had done his part. He had allowed God's vision to lead him. God's people could see the future ahead. At the end of Martin Luther King's life, he preached a sermon titled, I See the Promised Land. And he closes the sermon with these exact words. I'm going to quote to you. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. But I'm not concerned about that now. 
I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I have looked over. And I have seen the promised land. And my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Those were the last words Martin Luther King ever preached. He was assassinated the very next day. It seems he had a sense he would not get there with them, but he had done his part. He had allowed God's vision to lead them, and God's people saw a new future just ahead. Folks, we are that future. We are the promised land people here in Modesto, in the here and now. Part three, 2020 Modesto. I want you to know that I became a pastor and chose to be ordained in the United Methodist Church because I truly believe that the church can be a vehicle for change. I truly believe that when we are brave enough to step outside of the ivory tower of our church buildings to take hold of God's vision of a new world and live out our faith through Christian action, I truly believe that God can use us as the antidote of all that plagues this world. I truly believe that the church can contribute to the elimination of social evil. I truly believe that if we as a global Christian body, a global Christian body with a huge footprint and massive witness, if we could collect our energy, our power, our agency, and along with the Holy Spirit's inspiration, we can very literally change the physical and spiritual reality around the globe. That is possible. And certainly in this nation, and definitely in California, and absolutely in the heart of downtown Modesto. I believe it is for such a time as this that we have been brought together in ministry, that we have been given eyes to see God's 2020 vision. So my prayer is that we may go forth this day to use our two freedom-fighting feet to march on towards God's future, which is here and now. Praise be to God. Amen.